Uh, I was asked by somebody who missed last week, are we still in Luke? And yes, we are. We, we don't move that fast. Uh, we're in the Gospel of Luke going verse by verse, and we're in chapter 12, and we're in a couple of interesting verses there. I joked last week that these are the kind of verses that don't end up on coffee mugs. You know, when you go verse by verse, you never know what comes next, and that's just the lesson of the Lord. And so I, I would love for you to uh, study along with me now as we pick up in Luke chapter 12, verse 49. And here we go. I have come to bring fire on the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord. Uh, Some thorny verses here in the title of today's sermon I call Family Feud. (laughs) Right? I remember that with Richard Dawson. That's how old I am. And it's an interesting show. Um, this This is difficult. These verses, they... They can be taken out of context, and they seem harsh compared to sometimes our expectations. But there are some valuable lessons for us in this. Last week, we looked at just the first two, because that seemed bad enough, right? The idea of coming to bring fire on the earth, um, and how we wished it were already kindled. But we, we understand that that fire meant a purification of the earth, right? Fire is a symbol in, in God's word of God's word itself, of purification and judgment. And Jesus wants to purify the creation that's fallen. That's why he wished it was already kindled. But he also wished it was kindled because that purification begins with his sacrifice on the cross. Nothing we can do can purify ourselves. We're reliant on him as the creator to heal us, to make this world, this planet, pure as it was intended. And he began that with the work on the cross. And that that distressed him as he, in chapter 12, is looking forward to that. That that created some distress. And I would imagine it would too. Because it wasn't just simply a physical death, which was gruesome. It was a separation from God. And it was the burden of the entire sin of all the world. And that, that uh, that is something I can't even imagine. So when he says, I have this baptism to undergo before that can happen, that's what he's talking about. But we pick up now in verse 51 with maybe one of the most controversial verses in the Bible. I don't know that there's a contest, but if there was, I'll bet this one would be in the top 10. It says, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. And that no, whenever Jesus says, I tell you the truth or I tell you, it's an emphatic no here. This isn't just like, well, maybe not. No, this is no, in no way. And that's that confronts us a little bit. It also is tied together with a parallel verse in Matthew. In Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 10, 34, Jesus communicates the same idea in a different audience, but it's the same idea when he says, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And I have seen atheists take that verse out of context maybe more than any other. I will tell you, I hope this doesn't make you angry. But on, online, you can find a lot of things online. Uh, online, I saw a, a, an atheist post saying this. Muhammad says, convert or die. Jesus says, I've not come to bring peace but a sword. Which terrorist do you worship? Oh, he's right. Do you understand that by taking that out of context? Jesus, I, look, I can assure you this verse was not intended as an inspiration to violence. Uh, I can assure you that Jesus is never advocating that we do anything other than love our neighbor. So let's deal with this idea of of the sword that he's talking about right away. Because the sword is a metaphor for the word of God. And there are times in the Bible, at least a half a dozen times, when the idea of God's word is thought of as a sword. Okay, And just in case we we need, I mean, I'm an engineer by training, so sometimes I need absolute proof of that where, you know, Word of God equals sword. I find that in Ephesians 6. I'm not kidding. Ephesians 6, verse 17. This is in a, a section of scripture where, where Paul is talking about to the church in Ephesus about putting on the full armor of God. 
And in this verse, he says, put on, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That helps me as an engineer. Thank you, Paul and the Lord. Okay, but it, it, it's, a, it's a metaphor for this. Four times in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, we see Jesus with a, a sword coming out of his mouth, which is the word of God. You know, when, when a weapon comes out of your mouth, it, it, it's, the idea is the words that you speak. So uh, this is not, the, the sword is not meant to be a violent weapon or a weapon of physical violence. But it, it, it is cutting. It does represent division. If you've studied the Word of God and you've read your Bible before, you know that the, the words of the Holy Spirit can convict you more than, than any guilt trip I could send you on. Right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, Joints and marrow, it judges thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That is powerful. See, I, this is what is meant by the sword. Division that will come from God's word. Do you realize that by reading God's word, you can actually separate your thoughts and your attitudes from your deeds and your motives. And that's something none of us can do. Now, however gifted of a speaker I might ever desire to be, Nothing is as powerful as God's living and active word that when it gets inside of you, it can do that. And if you've experienced that, you know that. There's sometimes people have come up to me and said, you were speaking right to me, or you must have been reading my emails this week because it was, uh, no, 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 not me. That is the power of the word of God. Amen? And this is what we see. So, so we can kind of put aside that sword nonsense. And, and if somebody really takes the Bible out of, out of context, I don't get too upset about that because I know that with, it, with just a little bit of explanation, we could tell them, no, the sword is not a weapon of violence. It is, however, though, it's, it, you can't get past the idea that it is divisive or divisive, depending upon which side of the Atlantic you're on. All right? So the, 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 there is division here. And this is when, when Jesus says, do you think I've come to bring peace? No, I tell you but division. So this, as, without taking it out of context, this verse is hard enough for us. Now I can give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. Jesus is not saying that he wants to bring division. Division will be a consequence of his sacrifice. Some will choose to accept it and some will not. And that, that will cause division. So I don't think he's suggesting that that's something he's excited about. I think he's suggesting it is a byproduct of the necessity of the purification of our hearts and our souls in this earth. Okay? Uh, one of the things that is hard for me, too, is this idea that when he says, I haven't come to bring peace on earth, I have people say, well, wait a minute. Jesus says he's come to bring peace on earth lots of times, and, and he actually does. In one of the most famous versions that we're going to practice telling at Christmas, right? This is, I think, Linus talking to Charlie Brown, right? In, in case, if, if that was your introduction to this verse, I don't know. But it was Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. You ready? Right? Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men. Well, that's peace, isn't it? But if you're a student of the Bible, you know that I haven't showed you that whole verse. Verse 14 actually reads this. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Did you realize that the peace of God is offered to everyone, but it's conditional upon God's favor resting upon you and you accepting God's favor? Did you realize that? I, mean, I, I, I really love the slogan, peace on earth, right? There's a wonderful song, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me, right? But peace on earth, if you offer it to someone, you can't always be responsible for whether they accept it or not. Amen? And this is, this is what Jesus is talking about. And, and just in case, in case we don't know that, Jesus taught this again, even more explicitly. When he's getting ready to send his disciples out on a little mini training mission, this was all the way back in Luke 10. Uh, it was begin, it, Luke 10, 5, and 6. He's getting ready to send his disciples out, and he says this. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Do, do, 
Do you catch this? Peace is offered. Offer peace. But peace can't be peace unless it's accepted. And that's unfortunate. Peace is an offer to some, but it's not a guarantee for all. And that's unfortunate. That is a reality, however. And we, we see now, let's set ourselves back in the context of Luke chapter 12. Jesus is talking to his disciples that are part of a Jewish nation. And all of his disciples are Jewish at this time, right? And there is a, a conflict that is building with the Jewish establishment. And while these words are things that we can derive meaning from, they're even more pointed in that context. Because what's going to happen to his disciples is that they're going to be pulled apart from their Jewish roots. See, the Jews at that time believed they were isolationists. They believed that their holiness was derived by their purity in maintaining their separation from the rest of the world. And that's wrong. That's wrong. God pronounces that that was wrong. But if you were a good Jewish boy at that time and you were one of Jesus' disciples, you did not think Jesus was offering this for other people. And Jesus hinted at this all the time with his ministry, you know. He came across a Roman centurion and said, you know, I haven't seen as much faith anywhere in Israel, right? So he's hinting at the fact that the ministry is going to be more inclusive, but for them it wasn't. It was just us. And so what's going to happen is those who follow Jesus are going to be torn apart from their Jewish roots, and it's not going to be pleasant for either side. These disciples, the followers of Jesus, are going to experience persecution. It's going to cause them to have intolerance, even at their family level. And it, and it will mean death for some of them. And, and for the Jews that rejected Jesus, well, in 70 AD, the complete destruction of their nation and the city of Jerusalem was the judgment for that. I mean, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say at least a half a million people died in that, in that the Roman siege on Jerusalem, maybe closer to a million and the number of crucifixions was in the thousands. And the temple was completely destroyed. So in 70 AD, this side is completely blown up. And these side, this side over here is experiencing persecution. So you understand that Jesus is speaking to people that this is going to play out in their lifetime. And he knows it. And he knows it. And these disciples are going to face a persecution from the whole world from the Jewish establishment, from their synagogues, and from their family. And, and, you know, you and I, well, we don't have the Jewish establishment to fear or our synagogue rulers, but becoming a Christian to this day means that you have to take up an enmity with the world, the world system. And that sometimes means a separation from your family, right? And that's what Jesus warns of. When he says in verse 52... He says, from now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. Right? One thing I want you to catch in that, it says, from now on. Now, that's interesting to me. See, uh, family feuds have been going on since Cain and Abel, right? I mean, there have been trouble in families. So if you think your Thanksgiving's a mess, trust me, it's been going on for thousands of years. Jesus didn't invent family feuds. But what he's saying here is from now on, I'm, I'm starting them. I'm, they're rising to an ultimate level with me. You know, it's almost like one of those Clint Eastwood movies where he says, you know, I didn't start this, but I'm going to finish it, right? You know, I get his squint and the cigar and everything. I'm, I'm glad you've seen a few of those. Those are good, those are good theology to work into a church service. Is it? <laughs> Every time we get a chance to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, so, uh, Sammy and Kyle get nervous because they're wondering... Which of us is which in that scenario? I think that's uh, Kyle's idea. I need to give him credit for that. But th this is the idea, you know, ultimately now, ultimately, every human soul, every human soul is eternal. It was made eternally. You know that because your consciousness survives even when you're asleep. Your soul was made to be eternal, and every human soul will either spend eternity, you know, 100 years from now, we will all know what that's like. And we will either spend eternity with God in a place we call heaven, or choosing to be apart from God. And I'm, I want to say that word carefully. I believe that is a choice that people make, to be apart from God. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28, 
It says, just as man is destined to die once and after that face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed, sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. You see that word many? And that's scary because it doesn't say all. This is many. But let's go on. Take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. This, there are some people that will not choose to accept the sacrifice of Jesus. And that breaks my heart. You can't imagine how much it breaks the heart of him who offered that. C.S. Lewis once wrote that the gates of hell are ultimately locked from the inside. And that's, that's tragic. So from now on, according to the words of Jesus, from now on, all humanity will ultimately be divided. There'll be sheep and there'll be goats. It's not because Jesus wants that, but because that is the reality of the purification and the method for that purification that God has provided. And so if we go back to Luke 12, Jesus knows that. He knows some people are going to reject him. And saying that people will reject him is probably too mild. They're going to kill him. That's, that's more than just, oh, no thanks, right? I reject salespeople when they come to the door. They actually killed him. And this is one of those things that, that I, I, I need to make sure that, that I, I communicate to you. See, Jesus, in my relationship with him, he's so gentle with me. You don't understand how much I have needed to be rebuked and corrected over my life. But he, and he is so gentle with me that in my relationship with the gentle God of the universe... I can tend to project that he is always that mild-mannered. And, and, you know, if we just think Jesus was just a mild-mannered good teacher, why did anyone ever just take the time to kill him and to kill him in a horrendous way? No, guys, they murdered him because they hated him and he was a threat. And that's a reality. And unfortunately, some of that, some of that falls on us too. And it was going to fall on his disciples. And that's... That's the separation he was talking about. In, uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, the night before he went to the cross, he explained to his disciples, beginning in verse 18, he says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. That's, that's not a comforting thought, but it is a reality. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. I, I don't know if you ever feel like the world hates you, but if you do, you're in good company. Our boss felt like that first. Amen? Becoming a Christ follower, then and now, is the most radical, countercultural thing you can do. It beats any tattoo. It beats any piercing. The most radical, countercultural thing you can do is to turn your back on the world system and become a follower of Christ. I've spoken before, it's like, it's like you're in a river. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes to dwell in your heart. And you're just no longer content to flow down with the flow of the current. And you begin to swim upstream. And while everyone else is floating, you begin to go, albeit slowly, in a different direction. This is, this is what happens as you become a believer. And, and when you stop floating and you turn up and face the current, if you've actually ever done that, you begin to notice just how strong that current is, and maybe you never did before. And you begin to notice all the things that begin to hit you that you were just floating along with before. And then there's another thing that you begin to notice, and that is that the people that you were with begin to just, by drift, slowly separate from you. See, in our day and age, we may not be taking up arms and having armed conflict with our brothers and sisters, Although I must tell you, some of you have described to me some pretty interesting family reunions. And, and some of you have described to me that perhaps you've not been uh, disowned, but many of you have been shunned for your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I can tell you for me that persecution has not been that bad. But I have experienced this drift. It, wasn't, it, it didn't take on a hateful tone. I didn't do it because I, I just couldn't bear to be around those heathen any longer. But it just was one of those things. All of a sudden, it, the, the began to go in one way and others began to go another. And Jesus warned us of that. And this verse, 
53 says they will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, Mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And if that sounds a little tedious and repetitive from the Department of Redundancy Department, right? It's because he's, I think he's quoting Micah chapter 7. Micah the prophet in chapter 7 verses 5 and 6 gave us a vision of what it might look like in Israel when that started to happen. And he said this, he said, do not trust a neighbor, put no confidence in a friend. Even with her who lies in your embrace, be careful of your words. (laughs) For a son dishonors his father, a daughter rises up against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the members of his own household. And like I said, for most of us, I really am hoping that most of you have an experience that was closer to mine becoming a Christian. I didn't see the people in my household as enemies, but I did find that I was drifting away from them, or they from me. I don't know. But we were going different directions in the river from now on. And there's a truth behind that. You see, when you become a new creation, your genealogy changes. And and make no mistake, when you become united, when you allow Jesus to be born again in you, and the Holy Spirit takes up residence, and you have given control of your life over to the God of the universe so that you can have communion with him as it was designed. You know, there's a God-shaped void in the heart of every person, and that's the thing we need. That's, of all the things you're looking for, that's the thing you need. And if you've got it, you need more of it. How's that? Maybe that's a good sermon. Maybe I should just stop right there. And that's, that's what we're talking But the minute that happens... You become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's one we should put on a coffee mug, right? Amen? But there's another one that's even more subtle. Back in chapter 7 of Luke, years ago, right? Jesus was asking some questions about John the Baptist. Because John, John the Baptist was in prison now. And he says, you know, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you among those born of women... There is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now, you think about that logically for a minute. What he's saying is of those born of women, those people that are human beings, just regular human beings, John may be the greatest of them. But once you become a new creation, it's like you're a new species. And even the least that is in that group is greater than the best that is in this group. It's no longer a comparison of people to people anymore. It's a new creation, a new species. You are now God united with man in a way that I can't explain, but I'm so thankful for. Amen? And that's that's different. See, your, your DNA will always tell you who your biological family is. And, and I hope you have great relationships with your biological family. But... There's something else that's going on. When you become a new species, you have a new genealogy. You have a new spiritual genealogy, don't you? You think about that for a minute. Think about the people that witnessed to you. Think about the people that told you about Jesus Christ, that modeled, maybe they didn't use words, right? They modeled what love was. They modeled faith and hope and grace and mercy in such a way that they engendered it in you. This idea of swimming upstream and that maybe this would be a good idea too. Each of you has a spiritual family tree. And this is pretty interesting because I'm not suggesting that you should completely forgo your earthly family tree. But Jesus here is suggesting that this one here, this is the one, the spiritual family tree, the kingdom of heaven family tree, that's the one that actually lasts. Those be the ties that bind. And he says it directly. In Luke 8, he said in verse 19, Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, Your mother and brothers are standing outside waiting to see you. He replied, My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Amen? I'm not thinking he was ever necessarily rude to his biological half-brothers and his, his mother, but he makes it really clear that this connection that we have as Christians for one another is deeper. 
It actually is deeper. It's spiritual and it's lasting and it binds. Amen? I don't say this to you so that you can forego your own family. I have really loved and learned so much from my family. I really have. So I'll continue to love them as long as they're good to me. (laughs) But Jesus' words are inescapable. Some of you have been forsaken by your earthly family. Your heavenly family in this room stands ready to take up their place. Okay? And for the rest of us, well, you know, there's a there's an odd backhanded warning that comes with this. And that is that we have got to avoid, now that we have a new family and we have a new genealogy, we have to avoid the mistake that was made in history by the nation of Israel. We have to avoid becoming isolationists. Because that would be easy to do. And, and frankly, it happens. You know, there's a study, I think it might have been one of the Barna surveys, that said that that you know, within a few years of becoming a Christian, most Christians no longer have secular friends anymore, right? Or just their old friendships are dissolved. And you know what? I know that happened to me. And it wasn't malicious. Like I said, I didn't say, depart from me, you heathen. I just all of a sudden, their language didn't sound right to me anymore. Their actions didn't sound wise to me anymore. I had more in common with Christians. I had more to learn from Christians and then more to share with Christians. So naturally, the river began to draw us apart as I swam upstream. And that's how that happened. And you know what? I've got to tell you something. In my case, because you know I'm a patient in the same hospital here as we're all kind of recovered. In my case, it was probably a good self-defense mechanism. Because it would have been real easy to just kind of keep drifting down the river with that group. We had a lot of fun tubing down the river, you know. And we had a good time. It would have been real easy to stay there or to be drawn back into it. So it was probably a good self-defense mechanism. But there's an unfortunate side effect from that, is that you can become an isolationist. You can become a holy huddler where the only people you ever know or associate with are people who think identically with you. And, you know, that's what got the nation of Israel in trouble. Because there's a reason, brothers and sisters, we're still in the water. And we may be swimming upstream, but I promise you there's a reason we're still in the water. My grandfather said, that's why when we baptized you, we didn't just hold you under and send you home. Right? He said, trust me, we took a vote on that. You're an obnoxious, precocious little boy. He's probably right about that. But there's a reason. There's a reason you're still in the water. There's some people that... Maybe you can share with, and you need to be able to associate with them. And you're still going to be swimming upstream, but there's a reason why you're, you're in the water. You know, I heard somebody say the other day, and it was kind of an interesting quote, said, you know, if Jesus were here today, you wouldn't find him anywhere near a church, you'd find him in a bar. And I think that's a little too extreme, honestly, but I get the point, and I hope you do too. First of all, I do think Jesus would be. Jesus went to synagogues and he taught from the scriptures. And I think he would come here and teach us from the scriptures. And I pray to God that we would be willing to hear what he has to say and change. Because nobody's going to get this exactly right. And when he corrects you, it should be, yes, sir. Right? But he would, I think he would come. And I don't know that you'd find him always in a bar. I really don't think that you would. But he certainly wouldn't be afraid to go there. Because he wasn't afraid to go hang out with people that needed him. And he wasn't afraid to touch lepers. And he wasn't afraid to be around people that were outcasts that could ruin his reputation. And so I urge you carefully to make sure that you are intentionally putting yourself in the water with people that might need to have you be the only Jesus they see for a few miles down the trip. Amen? I urge you to think about that. I want to tell you a story. My wife is here, so she can correct it if I get it wrong. Um, but my grandmother used to have these things they just called garage parties. She lived in Marble Falls. And uh, it, Marble Falls used to be not so crowded. It was always a great place to go. And she had a small house, and we would, hundreds of us would descend upon that house the weekend between Christmas and New Year's. And there was no room. Of course, she thought there was room for at least 10 more people all the time. I pray that somehow God will give me that delusion because that's a wonderful thing to have. Always we could take two more. We'll find a place for you to sleep too 
on top of each other maybe. I, it was crazy. But she would open her garage and we would have a garage party. And you didn't worry about sanitation. You didn't worry about how clean it was. And you didn't worry about who had much food. We always had enough food. And if we, somebody would get some more or whatever, it was such a deal. And my wife and I were inspired by that. And she does more of the work here. I do more of the inspiration, right? She's the perspiration. I'm the inspiration in the family. We have a Shrek and Fiona kind of a relationship there. But we decided about a year ago, and I just tell you this because we've had such great results doing this. We decided we would open our garage and invite our neighbors. Do you realize I'd lived in the same neighborhood 20 years, and I don't even really know some people that are three houses down from me. And we live in a culture where that's possible. And I was convicted of that. And my wife said, well, let's do it. So the first Sunday of every month now, we open our garage, and we have a neighborhood garage party. And I am amazed at the results. I can't tell you there's been healings and baptisms and dedications yet. <laughs> but there have been, there have been people that have been getting together. And we've been sharing each other's burdens. And I've been getting to know the people that live right there where I'm planted. Please make sure you have some way to do that. Amen? Amen? Because, you know, God took the nation of Israel. Oh, he, he took that away from them. He took, because he said, I want to take this vineyard away from you and give it to people that will produce its fruit. And that's us for now. So let's make sure we are being intentional. The natural drift will pull us apart. Jesus is warning us of that. And sometimes it's a natural drift, and sometimes it's just the reality of the fact that you can only choose one of those two doors. But as long as possible, that offer of peace, it's conditional. But you know, I started thinking about it. It's conditional, but I can offer it to my neighbor. And I can, I can bring peace on earth one soul at a time by making sure the people around me all at least receive the best offer I can present to them. Amen? So let's do that. Let's add some more people to the family of God. There's always room for one more, as my grandmother would say. And let's, let's change their genealogy spiritually as ours has been changed. Would you join me as we pray? Father in heaven, how grateful we are that you have bound us to your heavenly family. We feel that fellowship and that love as we come together. We remember with great thanks those that led us to you in our heavenly family tree. <laughs> we ask now, Father, that you allow us the privilege of adding to that family. Father, lead us to people and lead people to us who will have a new identity forever because we will tell them about your love and we will tell them about the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Far side of the sky. The first thing that I'm gonna do is spread my wings and fly. I'm gonna land beside a lion, run my fingers through his back. Step for step, and I'll tell him how I missed him every minute since he left. And then I'll hug his neck.
stand forever in the light of his amazing grace.